Welcome everybody to Samudra Shakti Online. I'm glad you're joining us. We have a planning committee that brings you Samudra Shakti Online, and it's the same planning committee that brought the live event Samudra Shakti, which occurred two years ago in uh, the Colorado Rocky Mountains. Yeah, and then right after that, we launched Samudra Shakti Online. So we've been going for two years online. Um, it was a great event out west, and we're just um, here to keep the Shakti, the energy, the Kula connected, collaborating. And I'm here to um, share my dear friend, Madhuri Martin, and a little bit of background on her. She's presenting tonight on Women in Yoga, Discovering Hidden Stories. From childhood, Madhuri was captivated by the extraordinary clarity that she experienced while constantly immersed in the natural world. And at age 15, she became a professional mountaineer and climbing guide, traversing the world's rivers, high mountain peaks, and passes. In 1986, she began her yoga study with Richard Freeman and K. Patabi Joyce. She met John Friend in 1990, becoming a serious student of Anasara. In 1999, Madhuri began her studies with the brilliant author and master of eloquence and storytelling, Martine Prechtel. She continues to study with Martine, who guides her passion for authenticity, spirituality, nobility, and legitimacy through the historical and geographical diversity of indigenous perspectives of the world's cultures and peoples past and present. So I'm going to hand this over to Maduri. She asked me to get started fast, so off the ground and to Maduri. <laughs> Thank you, Lisa. Can everybody hear me okay? So I want to introduce our talk tonight. Um, the inspiration from this talk came from Anya Sara's newest module in our teacher training, um, which is on women in yoga. And while I was researching this topic to teach the Women in Yoga Weekend, I discovered and have come to appreciate a concept that is so incredibly powerful and important for long-term health and vitality for every woman at every age and for men as well. So this extraordinary thought, this extraordinary revelation it really belongs to all of us. And I believe it should be taught and spread and shared as fundamental knowledge of a universal principle with, a, with astonishing benefit for all of us. So um, in this way, it is perfectly aligned with Anyasara Yoga. And as I've explored this through the last few months, even better, I have found that Anyasara Yoga is perfectly aligned with it as well. So I'm super thrilled really to start sharing this with you tonight. Um, and we will start right here. We will start in the body of an aging woman. <laughs> That's me, <laughs> I'm almost 60 and things are changing. Anybody else feel that? in their bodies, you know? Yeah, things are changing, right? And so what I have found with this change that I wanna talk about tonight, there's many, many things, but what I wanna talk tonight, about tonight is this understanding that as we age, that cushion of neutral in terms of our life choices slims and it even disappears. Our choices start to settle in one of two camps, either healthy or harmful. <laughs> um, this starts with our food choices, our exercise and sleep, which we all know. But what I'm noticing is it extends to our social connections, the orientation that we choose to define our reality, the thoughts we think, the emotions we indulge in, the truths that we settle on to guide our lives et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All of that, as we get older, especially as we get older, it quickly splits into one of these two camps, health or harm. And as that in-between place, that band of living that is impartial or unbiased 
gets thinner and thinner, our choices get much more important as a result of the choices um, we see immediately and with considerable consequences. Does it, do other people kind of see that too? He's understanding what I'm saying here. So for example, we can't just go out and party all night, right? Because the effect of that the next day is like, oh, right, serious consequence on that. Even a single glass of wine affects me much more intensely than it did when I was younger. So that's what I'm talking about. So the potty function specifically that I'm speaking about tonight is hormonal balance. And we're going to start this with um, the allopathic understanding of hormones. So allopathically, the allopathic approach to the hormone study is, is wonderful in terms of that our Western medicine has this incredible ability to divide, to define, to, to track, to diagnose, and, and to see the unseen. And when it comes to hormones, that is typically an unseen event. So the hormones, just as background, we've found out regulate all biological processes in the body. So a hormonal imbalance can affect a wide range of our bodily functions. And here's a list of some of those functions that the, our, our hormonals, you know, that our hormones are in, really important and in charge of keeping as regular and healthy. Metabolism, heart rate, sleep cycle, growth and development, mood, body temperature, brain function, organ function, inflammation, immune system, all of that is, is really conducted by the hormones in the body. Here's just a quick slide on how the hormones uh, and the endocrine glands are organized in the body and which hormones come from which organ or uh, endocrine glands. I won't go into it much other than to say there's about 45 active hormones and they are, you know, and they are created in, the, in this particular configuration. So from a Western perspective, symptoms of hormonal inadequacies or, or some kind of hormonal dysfunction take on these particular, you know, these particular symptoms, right? Weight gain, you know, bloating, skin rashes, bulging, blurred vision, irritability, anxiety, you know, a tremendous amount of symptomatic uh, understandings with the hormone, you know, from hormone imbalance. We know that in Western medicine. But what's interesting is the Western medical approach to solve these symptoms is really more condensed and concentrates on these very much more severe sort of conditions. Polycystic ovary syndrome, hormone replacement for birth control, um, early menopause and menopause, primary or, or, or ovarian insufficiency, ovarian cancer. These are the kinds of things that they say, okay, we're gonna treat that with hormones. Not all these things, just this. And so I want you to note really quick what's missing from the Western perspective. It's like, what about cholesterol levels and obesity? What about insomnia and mood and stress and headaches and illnesses of all types and allergies and pains and inflammation and cancer and Alzheimer's, you know, all of these conditions, why aren't we treating them with hormones? So, because we know that you know hormones are a big part of this. So this is the reason, is because of our in those treatments, we've got some pretty serious side effects and risks. So here are some of the Western hormonal treatments that we consider worthy to apply to certain physical conditions. But look at the side effect list. Can you guys read that? Weight gain, nausea, diarrhea, acne, mood changes, headaches, vomiting, cramps. Do I sound like one of those commercials for some like pharmaceutical drug? Indigestion, vaginal breathing, bloating, swelling, rashes, low sex drive, mood swings, insomnia, hot flashes, hair loss, bone and joint pain, depression, anxiety. Please contact your physician for a prescription. 
right? I mean, do you remember like those things? I was always stunned when they came on. But what I want to point out too is, that, and I'm not sure where the line crosses, but what happens when side effects becomes risks? The risks we're looking at for typical Western hormonal treatments are liver injury, birth defects, blood clots, gallstones, cancer, dementia, Alzheimer's, strokes, really significant. And these aren't like unusually seen, these are seen often. So Western hormonal treatment is a little bit scary. It's something that we want to consider very carefully before we decide, yes, this is the best thing for me to do. I want to take a moment now to switch over to Ayurveda and traditional Chinese medicine. When it comes to balancing hormones from the Ayurvedic and traditional Chinese medicine perspective, this we basically go from the perspective of let's optimize the environment to shift the hormones in response to an optimal environment. So we're looking at changing nutrition, lifestyle, and natural herbal supplementation when it's needed. And if we're able to do this skillfully enough, we get extraordinarily effective results. So the general rule in what we call Eastern medicine is like increases like. I just put this slide here so that you can see Ayurveda and Chinese, uh, traditional Chinese medicine. There's a lot of similarities. There's some differences. They both have kind of a five elements system. Um, the Ayurveda medicine goes more towards gunas and doshas and traditional Chinese medicine goes more towards, you know, um, organ function and flow. So, but what we, what's similar of both of, both of these perspectives is that each individual does have a unique constitution and for each of these perspectives, we want to focus on creating balance and flow. So flow. So this, uh, I, I learned this from one of my acupuncturists, Matung Tung is a, a kind of a famous Chinese saying. It says, if it doesn't flow, it hurts. In her book, Balance Your Hormones, Balance Your Life, Dr. Claudia Welsh, this is a really important and incredibly great book. Everyone should read it. <laughs> if you haven't read it, please read it. it I was turned on to it by our friend, uh, our beautiful uh, matriarch, uh, one of our matriarchs in Anyasara, Jackie Prate from New York City. And she's just like, Maduri, that's the book. And she's right. Lisa, would you mind putting that in the chat? It's called Balance Your Hormones, Balance Your Life by Dr. Claudia Welsh. And what she does is she's taking these 45 major hormones and all of their interreactions and all of their dynamics and their communications and their systems and all these very complex uh, situations that are happening in the body. And she's like, look, 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 let's just slow it down and make it very simple. First of all, she identifies a stress epidemic. She believes that in our current culture, we are all under a lot of stress all the time. And that is one of the great factors that mean, brings about a hormonal imbalance. So let's just separate our hormones into the yin and the yang. And we have yin hormones, which she calls sex hormones, and the yang hormones, which she calls stress hormones. So we have this like sex and stress that also will align themselves in our two camps that we were talking about before, health or harm. So the yin hormones have these qualities of cool and dark and soft and slow and moist and stable and succulent and tranquil. And the qualities of yang are more like hot, dry, fast, mobile, aggressive, bright, energetic. So, when we're looking at the yin qualities, the yin hormones, those sex hormones, what we're looking at is creating substance and mass 
in the body, nourishment and juice in our joints. When we're looking at the yin program, they, the, yin, the yang hormones, the stress hormones, they take that mass, they take that substance of the body and they move it into action and into motion. So as the yin are nourishing, the yang are reducing. As the yin form, the yang transform. As the yin take in, the yang digest. So what she's saying with her stress epidemic is that we've got too much yang. And if we don't balance it with enough yin, the yang starts to eat away at the yin hormones that would usually fuel that and search for fuel in other places. If we have too much stress, the yang hormone will search for fuel in the bone marrow, in our joints in our organs, in the brain. So it starts to debilitate in this unbalanced way, always, you know? It's a very interesting, to me, a very interesting concept to keep in mind. So our step, sex hormones, I'm not gonna go very deeply into them. You can take a, you know, a screenshot of this slide or look into them yourself. But what I mostly want to say about this is as we age in the woman's body, this kind of postmenopausal, we not only generate less sex hormones, but we generate less sex hormone receptors. They decrease. So our ability to access the sex hormones in the body decreases. Then if we add stress to that, the spikes on stress hormones sacrifice those sex hormones in order to fuel the stress. So the difficulty that we're having here is that we have less access to stress, less, stress, le less um, access to those sex hormones in the body. And the stress hormones still need something to fuel their situation. Here's a quick slide of the stress hormones, the major yang hormones. They're the survival hormones. And what we wanna understand about this dynamic in the body is that the sex hormones are wonderful. They're cuddly, they're juicy, they're beautiful, they're exciting and, and nourishing in that way. Um, they're, they're, they're lovely, but it's the stress hormones that are needed. So we sacrifice our long-term health for a short-term stress hormone response if we have too much stress in the body. So too much cortisol creates higher sensitivity to stress, which releases more cortisol. Hormone resistance and thyroid resistance require more cortisol. We hinder our sex hormone functioning. It promotes the breakdown of yin. We hinder insulin functioning, compromising the immune system, accelerating aging. We get depression, osteoporosis, high blood pressure, and of course, adrenal fatigue from having a lot of stress and not enough sex hormones to balance it. So I want to pause at this slide for a second to ask you for just in a moment, what, what category do you feel that you live in? Are you in right now? Can you guys just throw it in the chat? And, and, um, and uh, you know, Lisa will, will kind of shout out, like, where are we in, do we have excessive yin? You know, the symptoms of that is congested and overnourished, bloated, heavy, overweight, excessive yawn, it's fast, hard, hot, aggressive energy, migraines, ulcers, manic, restless, angry. Our chi becomes stagnant, increased irritability, restlessness, and pain. So that's excessive yin and yang. Insufficient yin, maybe we have hot flashes, emotionally isolated, dryness, fearful, anxious, insomnia, anemic, weak, and dizzy. Insufficient yang, our chi becomes depleted. Our body eliminates our elimination systems are faltering, fatigue, scattered, chilly, misstepping? Or are we in this alt optimal place where we feel fulfilled, nourished, content? Whoops. 
sorry about that. Um, appropriate natural flow, deep sound sleep, physical, mental, and emotional and spiritual ease, or optimal yang, confident, focused, engaged, transforming food into blood, tissue, and energy. So what do we have, Lisa? Where are people? Well, um, we have uh, need more sleep, <laughs> symptoms of excessive yin, post-menopause, excessive yang, insufficient yin, uh, definitely, hold on, I scrolled the wrong way, uh, depends yeah. on the day is another one that came up, definitely loss of libido, yeah, and so in, optimal yin again, with please, the sleep and ease, yeah. Right. So in, in general, for women, and as women get older, we move into a place where we have insufficient yin and excessive yang. And these are the symptoms that are basically happening. And so this is the balance that we're looking at trying to optimize. So <clears throat> um, what I'd like to take away from this slide is that again, sex hormones are nice, but stress hormones are essential so the body prioritizes them, right? And under stress, the body supports the stress response, not the reproductive juicy tissue beauty response, which let's be honest, we'd rather have that going on. So we have to look at this stress situation. Um, when yin and yang are not balanced, we deplete both our sex and our stress hormones. And then it goes a little bit into, as we age, the decrease of the availability of these stress, horm stress hormones, sex hormones, excuse me, to mitigate the stress in our life. Even with all of that and in the aging body, Claudia Welsh in her book would say, you know what though, the lack of sex hormones is not the problem. It's the increase in stress hormones that's the problem. And we see ourselves, even as we age as women, coming into more and more um, stressful life. So how, like, you know, this is like, oh my gosh. So she um, gave an example in her book. She was telling a story about one of her clients. And her client was a runner who would run three to five miles a day four to five times a week. And she felt like, oh, that's way too much stress, way too much activity. You need to chop that down. Now, I was really struck by this story. I'm from Colorado. <laughs> in, in Colorado, um, an activity level of three to five miles a day for four or five times a week, we just go, oh, that's, that's cute. <laughs> that's adorable. <laughs> So it's not at all the like the level of activity that we as Coloradans really love to participate in. So I'm going to show you this slide as like a typical. This just happened a couple of weeks ago in the in a town very close to where I am right now in the mountains of Colorado. Watch this. This is what we do. There's a the gun just went off and. People are running with their burrows and donkeys. Is that what's going on? Like, what is up? This is Colorado, right? So, so this is the annual burrow race. The slogan of the annual burrow race is the fastest ass wins. And what this is, this is in um, tribute to our mining background in Colorado, the Colorado mining background. And this is in, the, in a little town called Leadville. Now, funny thing about Leadville, it is the highest altitude town in the continental United States. So this borough race is starting at 10,200 feet. And it goes over this Mosquito Pass, which is at 13,200 feet. You can, as a borough race individual, choose the short course, which is 15 miles, or the long course, which is 22 miles. So, and the funniest thing about this borough race is that boroughs don't like to run. Boroughs hate running. 
Like to get a burrow to run a few miles is an insane thing to do. So the race ends up looking a lot more like this. So what we're like now, we've got a Colorado sport, right? Now we've got, okay, we've got high altitude, 10 to 13,000 foot elevation, 15 to 22 miles while we are dragging a four post animal, 400 to 500 pounds with us the entire way. And that's what we call fun. That's like something that we do just to like enjoy the weekend. So I'm sitting here listening, you know, reading her story in the book going, well, wait a second. As an older woman, I wanna be able to do my burrow race, right? I want to be able to run with my beloved. My beloved, for example, Amory, he, there is a, uh, there's a triathlon, a full triathlon on Saturday this weekend in Boulder, Colorado. And then on Sunday, there's a hundred mile bicycle ride race. He signed us up for both of them, okay? Like this is how we like spend our time as a loving couple together in Colorado. So I'm sitting here going, okay, Okay, okay. Claudia, you're making some great, great, great points. I really am listening. You have my full attention, but I want to be active. I want to, I like, I want to be able to do these things. And, and I was thinking, wow, I have this huge Ashtanga background, which is a very feisty yoga practice. And I have this incredible Anyasara background. And let's be honest, our Anyasara yoga practice is also, it's like very full very feisty. If I can't do my Anyasara yoga practice with my dear friend, Jay Martin, and that, you know, you guys who know Jay Martin know that that demands a lot of handstands, a lot of dropbacks, a lot of back bends, a lot of let's keep going and flow and fluidity. Then am I like robbing my body of this balance that it absolutely requires? So this really struck me. This struck me as like, I got to figure this out and see and solve this problem. So my thought process then went here. How do we cope with stress? How active can we be without that stress response that dumps the stress hormones into the system and starts eating our organs and our bone marrow? How do we optimize and balance our internal hormonal environment while living an active lifestyle? And most importantly to me, how do we make our Anyasara yoga practice super, super sexy? So this is my, like my situation, my conundrum here. And um, I want to figure it out. And I have been really exploring this for a long time. And I know that a lot of you out there probably aren't doing burrow, you know, this like level of triathlon and bike racing and all that stuff that we love to do in Colorado. But at whatever level of activity you are, how do we approach that in a way that doesn't overstress the system? So at this point, I would love for you all to find yourself lying down, go to the place that you created in your space and go and lie down very comfortably. You can bend your knees or put your feet. Lisa is, is smiling. Lisa, do we have some comments in the chat that need to be shared before we go on? <laughs> uh, one of uh, our regular uh, people that joins is Becky. Just puts in the funniest one-liners in the <laughs> chat. So I'm just like busting up over one-liners. All right, let's hear it. Let's hear a couple before well, we go on. She's, we, I was just saying we all need to like share how we, um, you know, how we use our life force. Maybe we're not pulling a donkey, you know, at 10,000 <laughs> feet for 15 miles, but what, what are we doing that's insanely fun? And so Becky, Says, I do haul ass now and then. Mm. <laughs> Just like a yeah, we do. Designer. Yeah, we do. Thank you, Becky. So anyway, can everybody please um, move on and get comfortable in their lying down position? Okay. 
Okay. So I want to give you guys a quick example. This is the sound of that yoga student that maybe is a couple of mats away from you. And they're approaching their Anyasara practice or their yoga practice with, with absolute attention and full on, you know, uh, a, a, a desire and passion. And it sounds like this. You guys know that person, right? That's just yes. young. And they're just like going for it. You gotta love the death out of them. But if we were to vote, is that an approach that's stressful or is that an approach that's sexy? The vote would be, that's really stressful. So the sexy breath is gonna be more one that is really full and juicy and, and, and wonderful, right? Um, so we're going to start, and we're and today. I just wanted us to have a chance to practice sexy, sexy breathing together. All right. So lying down in our pranayama practice. Start your ujjayi breath, and everybody here is pretty familiar with ujjayi breath. There's a slight closure in the back of the throat. The wind comes between the, you know, from the nostrils into the body and the mouth is softly closed. So I'm finding a little bit of feedback. If somebody is, um, has their microphone on, you can turn it off. If not, then, you know, just so we can all enjoy our pranayama practice. So, and then what I'll do is I'll just describe to you some things to think about in our pranayama practice as you're lying there enjoying your breath. The mouth is softly closed. And internally, you want to create a dome with the mouth. This is a welcoming invitation for the breath into spaciousness. Listening becomes key. In our asana practice, we start with listening. In our relationship, it's a really good place to start. Can we learn to listen? As we're listening right now, can we discern the quality of the breath by listening to the sound of the breath? Smile softly inward. Draw your breath into long, smooth threads.
make the sound of the ingoing breath the same as the sound of the outgoing breath. And as we continue, gradually deepen the breath, smooth the breath, we start to align ourselves with the rhythm of the complete cycle of the breath. And at the end of the breath, we, we find gaps, places of pause. So we want to stay awake during these gaps. We want to stay fully awake during the entire inhalation, the entire exhalation. And we want to feel that rhythm sync up with the rhythm in our body. Become this one rhythmic pulsation. This takes patience. This takes time. Enjoy that ujjayi sound, that steady calling. The ujjayi breath is also called ajapa mantra, which is the sound that has no specific meaning. And that is what makes it so incredibly sacred. The ujjayi sound, ajapa mantra, is there's no religious position that we need to take, no theological opinion in this particular mantra. We simply experience pure breathing as it is. Come back again and again to this inconceivably sacred sound of the breath. Relax any tension on the inside of the ears, the deep internal ear. Relax that tension. Open the ears to give space. That's the first step of listening. 
And when we listen in this way, we give space to what is, not what we want, where we want it to go. There's no pushing, there's no pulling. There's just what is. This is particularly important because this space that we create occurs by shifting the way the mind relates to pattern and the way the mind relates to change. The way the mind patterns sensation and feeling everywhere. So by making space, which is key to being sexy, we can shift how we emotionally react to pattern and change. Take a fuller breath in, recognizing that you'll be transitioning from this meditation that Maduri offered. Make any movements in any direction that you need to make. Keep making shifts and changes until you feel ready to pick a side to roll to and from side lying, come to seated. And you can even just pause there. If you'd like to take a moment to absorb what you just received from the meditation that Maduri offered. Maybe notice the difference in how you feel from the beginning of laying on the floor to now. Maduri's presentation was about the stress response and how it robs us of our life force. When you feel ready, come on back to seated and join us.
So Maduri's internet, like all things in the world, right? You know, the tech, the tech gods got her and uh, snafooed her today. Uh, thank you, Lisa, for covering me and for getting everybody back with us today. Um, so the, the, the whole point of this practice, the whole point of this presentation is for us to become more sensitive to approach. Right, so our approach is, let me even just, I'll share the screen really quick. So our approach being like, this is why Anyasara is such a great, you know, is so, is so well uh, configured to address this very fundamental universal principle of whole body health in terms of this hormonal understanding. And you can take, again, a screenshot of this or whatever, but it really isn't about the level of activity. This is what I'm discovering over the months that I've been playing with that. It's not about the level of activity, it's about how we approach that level of activity or how we approach a problem or how we approach our asana practice or how we approach our relationship. Can we approach what is the attitude right? It's right back to Anyasara. How are we aligned? And then from there, how do we continue with the action? So kind of the whole like punchline of this presentation is that, um, that there is this, this element of us, yes, we are dragging a four or 500 pound stubborn animal up over 13,000 foot passes in our lives all the time. That's like what we're doing. And can we do that in such a way that it's super sexy? Can we do that in a way like as we were like lying on the floor doing that deep breathing and that rhythmic connection with ourselves? Can we keep that even as our, our, our lives get stressful and intense and so that whatever level of activity we're doing, we're doing it consciously and in a way that just engenders an optimal internal environment. And my guess is if we have an optimal internal environment, then any outcome from that optimal internal environment will be a better outcome than one that is overly stressed or overly uh, imbalanced. So that's basically um, the whole thing. The so hormones are fundamental and hormone theory is a universal principle that Anyasara is just uniquely designed to address and assimilate as a universal principle. So that was all I had to say. Thank you guys so much for coming. And I apologize for the interruption. Thank you, Lisa, for covering. Keep it sexy, you guys. That's all I have to say. Keep it super sexy. <laughs> Love you all. Thank you.